everybody can ask for whatever they want and everybody can say yes or no. That's the way this business works. If somebody says yes, that's the price. David, I am so excited for this. This is one of the favorite discussions. I, mean, I write a schedule and I'm like, I don't know really why I'm writing it because I know we're not going to stick to it at all. But thank you so much for joining me, David. Thanks for uh, having me back, Harry. Excited to do this. Are, now, we, are we sparring today or we're just going to have a light, uh, fun conversation? Oh, no, I'm, I'm ready for a duel. This is okay. like a fight for the death. Okay. Uh, I brought, in, in brought my, camp. yeah, ready to go too. Uh, tell me, for those that missed our first show, how did you make your way into van shit? 60 seconds. Yeah, I uh, I grew up loving the internet and that's what I, I fell in love with as a kid. And uh, I never understood what the career path uh, into this world is. And I actually don't think uh, there is a traditional one. I think everybody finds their own way. And my way was, um, you know, I, I joined an organization called Techstars early on. And when I did that, I signed up to be an investor and Box Group uh, at that time was my side hustle. Uh, and then in 2012, left Techstars to do Box Group full time. Uh, so now I'm 11 years into that uh, full time Box Group journey. So I'm, I'm old in this world. Now, before, you know, I absolutely maul you on your portfolio construction, I wanted to kind of do a little bit of um, armchair psychology. And so I believe that we're all functions of our history, David. And so what are you running from, do you think? I mean, you're getting deep, Harry, really quickly. I feel like I've seen the internet evolve and in general, you know, had a vision for what was going to happen. And a lot of that ended up happening. And I feel like I watched it and wished that, I participated in some of it. And so uh, I, I think the history of being the age I am and watching the evolution of uh, this world sort of pushes me forward. Can I ask a personal one? Yeah. <laughs> Someone asked this and they said, you know, your family is very successful. And they said, Did, were you running from the perception of like being one of the family members and wanting to strike out on your own? I mean, I, I think it's a, there's there's a lot of nuance in that answer. I'm an individual and I have my own ambition and desires and goals that are not necessarily attached to the history of my family. At the same time, I have an immense appreciation for uh, the blessings of, of coming from a, a group of people that worked really hard and found success. And so it's not this rebellion or desire to to strike out on my own as much as it's like, I love what I get to do and it happens to be in a different world than what other people uh, have done. And so it's um, it's not a, a negative lens of it versus a sort of positive one. Final one before we dig deep on, on portfolio. Success has many different kind of connotations and meanings. What does success mean to you? Yeah, I I think I take the personal perspective of like success is building a life that you're content with. And whether that's uh, family or, or friends or uh, the people that surround you, I think there's, you know, the core of, of that answer is there. And then on the work side, our goal is to be part of other people's journeys. This is a job that actually isn't about us, but really about the founders we're fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work with. And watching them succeed brings us both emotional and, and psychological success, but also financial success. So I think there is real alignment in uh, the success of the people we're, we're able to work with. I, I, I totally agree with you there. I always say for me, it's like I want to be 75 and in an armchair and have grandchildren running around and I want them to point at companies and me to be able to say, oh, you know, box group or 20 VC uh, play a tiny role. Win, right. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Um, that, that that's mine. I want to move to the fund itself. So you raised 127 and a half each, I think 255 total between two funds in 21. Can you just walk me through the portfolio construction in terms of how many companies per fund for each one first? Yeah, I, I don't think the details are as interesting. I think the model is is what's probably more interesting. And so our goal is to work with the best founders we're able to have the opportunity to work with. And I think more than anything, it's not putting our business in front of the founder and not making our needs important enough to stop us from investing in a company. And so it really is about agility and flexibility as we think about deploying capital. At the seed fund level, our goal is to back people 
at the company formation or soon after. So in a traditional seed round, we're happy to be the second, third biggest check on a cap table. In a pre-seed round, we're happy to lead it. And so I think the goal is to say, how much money are you looking to raise? How much money is available for us to put in? And let's find a, a place where we're both content with uh, that arrangement. Okay, so you have 127 and a half million in one. I I have this conversation with you know my pre-seed partner often, where it's like, oh, we can only get a hundred. Now I have a 33 million dollar seed fund and a 110 million growth fund. There's there's no point in me writing 100k checks. It it doesn't make sense. And so where is that barrier for you of not letting business get in the way and a too small check? I I don't I don't have one. Um, and I don't necessarily walk in and say, this doesn't make sense. If the core of the decision is this is a company that we want to be part of. And can I build a portfolio of only a hundred K checks? That feels like a bad decision. Can I build a portfolio where there are exceptions to the norm throughout in different ways? Yes. And is our, our, individual exceptions capable of uh, creating venture returns on an individual company basis? Probably not. Now, like there's exceptions to that rule, right? If you put 100K into the, the best company of a generation, it was likely a good decision. So you can fake rationalize the math version of that answer, and you can logically rationalize a handful of other directions as to why that is a logical decision. I think um, it's easy to put up rules. It creates consistency and it aligns to fund math. And I appreciate that. But we we truly hold to the idea that we want to invest in companies we're excited about. And if what we're able to invest is not in perfect alignment with the math, we're willing and able to make exceptions. Do you worry that by having that stance and being open in that way, I can say to founders and everyone else can say to founders, your Frankels of the world, your IAs of the world, we love David. He's awesome, which I'm sure we all do, but he'll take 100K. Like, let's push him down. Like, we can get him down. to. And so the messaging means that you're saying I will be able to go down. And that's something that I'm always very careful. I'm I'm asking your advice here, honestly, David. I'm not arguing. Yeah, do I worry? I worry about everything. But like... I'm focused on founders more so than other VCs. And I think if we can build a brand and a reputation with the founders that we're fortunate enough to work with, their goal is going to be to give us uh, an aligned amount of allocation in a round and not treat us in in sort of that, um, you know, pushy way. And I think there's a history that's 13 years deep of... Box Group building great relationships with founders where uh, people want to work with us and won't take that uh, approach to it. And um, it tends to be when we're late to a company and there's not a lot of allocation left that flexibility matters more so than other VCs pushing us around. Uh, Can I ask, you know, one thing that I think is, is troubling is like, Almost 100k or 250k in the generations of old when, you know, me, well, you were a little bit before me, but I was doing this eight years ago. Like, you know, it was the, the you know, five to 10 million pre seeds and seeds. For the last five years, we've seen 25 million seeds. And then the 150 is really very different. Like, it, it's just huge. Like, how do you think about price sensitivity at pre seed and seed? Do you take the same less if, uh, hey, it's fine? Or are you much more sensitive there? Yeah, look, our our goal is to invest as much as we can in the company that that we're excited to invest in. And it's not maximizing check size. So we write a 500K, 750K, million dollar check. We do that as the core of our business. It is a target in the majority of companies that we're able to work with. Valuation is the second piece of that. So you, you get to ownership in each company through those two basic numbers. Is there a a strong rule on any of this? No, but on a portfolio basis, we find a balance of all these things. Valuation is 
not something that as an a, a investor you actually control. I, I just don't believe that the market as a whole controls that. So if a founder gets enough optionality for their round that they're able to raise at a valuation that you as an investor don't like, you have two options, invest or don't invest. It's it's a binary. If if you get the opportunity to invest and this is the deal, you can say yes or no. And so I can sit here and complain about valuations, but if I'm a founder, my job is to build a company that is a lot bigger than whatever valuation I'm raising my seed and pre-seed at. My job is to take the capital and create immense value so that the next round and the next round are are bigger. If a company goes well, the pre-seed, the seed, those are the lowest points that you're ever going to be able to invest in a company at. Would I like to own more of our of the best investments we've ever made? Would I like for us to have written a bigger check or it, you know the valuation to have been cheaper? Sure. But that's not realistic. And so you you have to be more than anything patient and long term and consistent. And when I look at our business, those are the three things that we hold true to. And on a deal by deal basis, you know, valuation is a fact and not a pain. I think I love this debate and you don't. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know I, if it's a debate. I just a debate because 500 to 750, David, means that if you write 100 checks at 750, which you're not, you're at 75 million deployed. Okay, so you say 127, take out fees, we're at, say, 100, just like total. Um, and so you've got 100 companies and you're only at 75 million for it. And what then? You've got 25% left for reserves. Like, is the fund not too big? My fund's too big if I can't produce outlier returns, right? That's my job. So I need to produce outlier returns. That's my, my responsibility to our investors, to our LPs, is to produce outlier returns. The way that we're able to do that is funding companies that have amazing outcomes and the math works itself out. So I, I don't obsess over the ownership and the portfolio construction in a way that I think it matters on a deal by deal basis. I think it matters on a portfolio basis. And so if the, the perfect alignment is we own the most ownership in the best companies in that given fund. That's the goal. I understand in some ways, but then I'm also looking at a lot of outcomes and bluntly, you have a billion dollar outcome, a $2 billion outcome. And actually when you only return 10 million or 20 million, really who gives a fuck? Sorry, it sounds awful, but when you got 120, it just doesn't make a difference. And so you know, our, our belief is that if a founder is able to build a company from the seed stage to a billion, a $2 billion outcome, there's going to be a lot of people that that's a life changing outcome for. And those are the, the journeys that we're signing up to be part of. And, uh, I don't view it as, as a dismissive outcome. Can I build an entire fund off of, um, billion, $2 billion outcomes? If there's a higher, high enough percentage of the companies that we invest in that end there, sure. But like, is that the ambition when we set out to deploy capital, that that's the target outcome for every company? No, we need to have and hope to have some outcomes that are bigger than that. And so um, not dismissive and deeply appreciative of, of, you know, you're investing whether in your world and, and your numbers at 25, at $50 million entry points or at five or $10 million entry points. That founder that embarks on that journey, exiting at a billion, $2 billion, as long as they didn't raise an egregious amount of capital and get offensively diluted along the way, they're going to have a wonderful day and they're going to have a wonderful life-changing moment in that journey. And that's what I'm here for. I get you. I didn't mean it dismissively, but I do mean it mathematically for fund returns. Which... I'm a seed investor. I don't, uh, you know, we're here for the dreams. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Oh, okay, hear me. Reserves wise, from the fund, 
how much do you have in reserves? You want to put as much money as you can into the best companies in the in the portfolio. I'm okay, but like that's how it. Many, so You're like, too, like like the math has to work. It's my job to make the math work, right? Like somebody is investing in our firm because it doesn't seem we to need be to much make math. Work. Other, it doesn't seem to be much math other than just like, well, let's just invest in the best founders. Well, actually. Yeah, but actually, also, Dave, like the thing you study in venture, which you know this, I'm sure, is in the good times, yeah, let's like invest in the best founders. And that works when you're shooting in good times, it's 10x funds and everything's great. But in the bad, bad times, when you do the studying, actually, the intense portfolio managers are the difference between 1x or 0.7x and 2x because they've religiously managed a huge amount from reserves, liquidity, and everything in between. But are and we so, in the bad times right now from a seed investing standpoint? I, I think we will be, yeah. From seed yeah. investing, though? No? Yeah, I think 21. My, my job is to fund you know, a 10-year journey. And so the macro change in the, in the environment impacts our prior investments uh -huh. much more so than our future investments. T the seed round tomorrow becomes relevant in the you know customer side of the market in the next one to four years. It becomes relevant in the venture market in the next one to three years to raise another round. Uh -huh. So the macro of today doesn't have this immediacy in terms of its impact on our seed business and our our deployment of the fund. Well, when does you it have a when, an impact when, on the on the reserves that I, you know, have to deploy into the pre-existing the the prior uh, investments? Sure. What, and when you look at okay, so sure. How do, how does it? We have to use the capital thoughtfully, and we have to back again the companies that we are most excited about. I and on a, it is so. I just don't believe in evaluating venture, especially seed venture, on a minute-to-minute, year-to-year basis. It is an incorrect use of energy and mind. If you're investing over, my, our fund life is a 10-year plus fund, right? Our companies that we're fortunate enough to back are going on a 10 plus year journey. And so in a moment in time, like, you can make up illiquid private valuations. You can mark things up. You can mark things down. It's a snapshot in a business where snapshots make no sense. And so I don't operate on short term. My whole life is oriented around long term. And I'm super content living there and actually trying as, as hard as possible to both live there in a zen-like consistency and get great at what we do. Our job is to back amazing people in good times, in bad times, in times where every series B is punishing. Our job is to help people navigate that and not obsess over our business because we believe that our business is going to work out over the long term if we back great companies. I love you, David. I don't think planning reserves is minute to minute over manipulation of our model. I think it's like bluntly. I am dodging your question and not getting into the details because I are you believe. Like a are you a politician? Are you no, doing but I, I truly don't think like how we go about managing that is that important in the abstract, which is what our, our conversation is going to remain in, right? It, it has to. Because you're not sitting inside of the decision room, looking at each decision that we have to make and understanding why we say yes and why we say no to a specific company. Our job is to deploy follow-on capital into ideally the best places we can. And it's the same with the opportunity fund, right? The, the follow-on, the growth fund. Our job is to lean into you know, investments that have the uh, chance to have outlier returns to that single investment and on a portfolio basis to the whole portfolio. If I was trying to build this business to hit, you know, what you said before, 1x, 2x funds, I should go do something else.
I I know I, I totally agree. I think bluntly, if you not you, but if the majority of any funds over five hundred million return one action in the last vintage, they'll be heroes. So I think there's a little bit of a restructuring going on in terms of how people think about upside on growth, not so much for early. You said about us, like, is this the crash? Um, I think so. At the twenty one twenty two entry prices that we saw, David. I mean, I'm being honest on mine. Yeah, I mean, good companies. But, <laughs> baby, they were Chanel. Like, they were not cheap. Um, th- and then on top of that, they're going to be going... I mean, like, mine are lucky, but many aren't, bluntly. Um, they're going to be going out raising in 23, some in 24. You know, Tom Levera at IVP is like, this is worse than uh, the GFC. Very uh, uplifting interview, that one is to come. Uh, <laughs> but, like... Yeah, I would say we're in the midst of the shit. We got in high, A, funding's down the tubes, and, like, I'm with you on the 10-year view, but actually some great companies take time to build, some need a lot more cash to build, and the cash is gone. So There have been down rounds and in, in sideways rounds in so many of the long-lasting great companies of prior vintages as well. It is not catastrophic that... You know, it is hard and there are bumps in the road for a company to to build. And so even if like, it's not this g- gigantic net negative for a founder that they raised at a high valuation, if they can power through a bump in the road, it's a net negative if they don't build a good company. If you don't build a product, you don't build a business model, if you don't build revenue growth that the market views as good enough. That's the problem. The valuation to me is the investor's problem. And I just don't like, I don't believe that my sympathy sits for all the VCs that overpaid on things that they did. Like everybody could, again, back to this, like you could have said no. If you thought something was too expensive, you could have said no. So if you said yes, am I losing sleep over the fact that like people's portfolios are too expensive? I don't know. Not my problem. <laughs> okay. Um, when you when you think about kind of like um, down rounds, as you said there, I, I see everywhere people like, oh, like there's going to be a wave of down rounds, there's going to be a wave of down rounds. And then we mentioned Albert Wenger before this when I said about how much I enjoyed having him on the show. He tweeted, actually, I've been in venture for 18 years and I've only had two down rounds. They're much rarer than people think. They destroy company morale. And where, where do you sit? Do you think we'll see a load? Or do you think Al- Albert's right and actually they're much rarer than well, people think? Well, there's just the thing that has not happened over the past three to four years, and it's really before 21 and, and 22, is that companies have shut down. And that's going to happen. And that's actually the the math that hasn't played out over that four year period in that when you see C to A graduation rates and A to B graduation rates, they went from a historical consistent uh, set of numbers, call it, you know, if you're if you're great at this 70 percent C to A and, you know, if you're great 50 to 70 percent A to B and over that 19 or 18 to 22 period. It went to basically 100, 100% of companies that raised the seed got an A. Maybe it was 90, 95. But like that's inevitably going to mean that certain companies don't work out. And they're going to not work out when they're later and bigger. And that is going to happen in the next 18 to 36 months. As runway runs out, as companies come back to market, as the businesses didn't work, and there's not an M&A market to do aqua hires or small acquisitions, companies are going to shut down. And that founder dream is going to come to an end. And there's going to be a bunch of people that work there that believed in the company, that had equity in the company, that hoped for uh, you know economic returns from the company that are not going to get it. And um, those are not down rounds. That is the sort of you know death of a startup that we just haven't experienced over the past four years. And I assume we're going to have that throughout our portfolio. And I assume that's going to happen in everybody's portfolio. Although everybody likes to say, you know, that's going to happen, but my companies are great. 
I, I, it's unrealistic that the math skews that way. Down rounds are, are to Albert's point, like they are going to be traumatic on company morale. But if you can figure out how to rally around that and a founder can figure out how to, you know, compensate the people that work there in a way that makes them re-energize to go build and tighten and uh, sort of move forward. Um, it It's just like a, a bump on a long journey. I think USV is also world-class and they have, you know, an amazing ability to select uh, unique quality companies and have been long-term partners for almost every investment they've ever invested in to see them through the tough times in a like unbelievably supportive way. And uh, it's why they're, you know, world-class VCs. I think the thing that worries me is um, actually the misalignment in expectations on pricing. I know you said our pricing, oh, like we, we, we're not the ones that said and whatever. Uh, <laughs> we disagree on a lot, David, but, but we'll just go with this. Like founders are coming in still and they're going, oh, I want 20, 25. And it's like, are you seeing the market? By a, if somebody gives them that, then the market is that, right? So but is, everybody but no, can ask for, but everybody can ask for whatever they want, and everybody can say yes or no. That's the way this business works. And then, at the end I, of the day, at the end of the day, if somebody says yes, that's the price. Sure, but it's bad advice. Like I, I, I would not want people to hear this and go, oh, I, like if what I would say to founders is actually, hey, go out with twelve and a half or fifteen. And you know what? If me and Dave both want it, and so does Albert, and so does David Frankel. You're going to get 25. You're going to get 25. But don't start at 25 because I'll say thanks so much. No. But that's the that's the choice you made, and that's the choice the founder makes. And if the founder wants to go talk to 200, 300, 400 seed funds, which there are these days, and one of them says yes and gives them money at 25. So there's like three variables, right? It's, it's how much money are you raising, at what price, and from who? And you can optimize, try to optimize all three. You can try to optimize one or two. And I think each founder takes an approach that's specific to them to each one of those variables. And so if I were starting a seed company, I would try to optimize all three. I'll get as much money as I need can at whatever price I can from the best people that I can raise from. And I think that that is... The job of a founder in each round is to think about those three variables and try to optimize the ones that are most important. David, which one would you let slip? You can only have two. Um, it matters the gap between who, uh, if you're talking about, you know, like my top choice versus my fifth choice, that's a fine compromise versus, um, you know, my top choice versus my hundredth choice. That's not a fine compromise. So I think you know, figuring out who you want to work with is vital. So I'd actually put that as the most important, but I think a bit fluid in it's not a perfect, like you don't just pick one person. So I, I would not over optimize for a single person, but I would put that first. The second is how much money is vital. You need enough money to make enough progress, to hire enough people, to to use that capital effectively uh, to build your company. And the third is price. So I think you end up having and, and should compromise on price if you can get the other two right. Yeah, no, I, I totally get you. Um, but just like, sorry, whether it's, it's not opinion based, this is pure stats. So don't, are you seeing prices reflective of the change of market? Because I'm not seeing seed and pre-seed pricing go down in the way that people would think or expect. I agree generally with that. I think there's too much, you know, sound bites on Twitter saying I'm seeing, you know, crazy cheap valuations. Um, it's just not. Uh, I'm like, it's because you're funding experience. shit companies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, um, <laughs> it, you know, we're seeing a bifurcation of the market. I think the biggest thing that happened and it really happened again, uh, I think people are trying to isolate 21 and, and, you know, the first part of 22 is equally frothy as this standalone period, but it started before that. So I would go back to like 2018, 19, and then into 20, which was this weird year with COVID and uh, sort of the shift to, to Zoom. Um, but the multi-stage firms have a product for seed that changed the market. 
They write a $5 million check at a 20 to $30 million valuation pre or post. So, and that $5 million check could be seven. So you're seeing rounds of five to seven at 20 to 30 pre or post. And that's a product that hasn't changed. And I don't think it's going to change. And I think it totally evolved the seed market to say, are you raising from a multi-stage fund? If so, that's the style standard deal that you can go get. And if you're not raising from a multi-stage fund, there's a different deal on the table. That's a two to four million dollar round. Maybe you can stretch it to five and that's being done at a 10 to you know, $15 million valuation. Uh, but single digits, uh, you know, it's not, it's not the norm. Now, at the same time, if you're early enough and at the sort of friends and family, as it's called, or the angel round, there's a different structure of that round, but it comes back to this, how much money, price, and and who. Um, do, do, and we I think still, could... do, we, do we still have those angel and friends and family rounds? Because when, sorry, just when I see people spin out of any great it company. Who, right? Not that person. Yeah. That person who's spinning out of a company with a great reputation, in reality, can and should go get you know, a, a bit more money because they have a different track record than the person who is totally unproven and needs to get some capital to show that their idea and their ability to build the thing they want to build is realistic. And so they're, they're my single worst investments. Those are my worst ones when they've spun out of any great company and they've raised five to seven because they're inherently slower because they're used to the processes of Twitter, of Facebook, the HR, the policies. And then they come out and they're given $7 million by Andreessen and 20 others, including me. And they don't need to hurry. They can go back to the processes of Facebook and Twitter. They don't need to have sprints like they do in normal startups. That's just slower. That's I think it's all, I think, I like, I hear you. I just think you're overly generalizing everything. There's... There is a cohort of companies that come out of big companies that raise very healthy seed rounds. They're going to build great companies. And there are a lot of companies in that category that are not going to be great. That's the inevitability of, of the world that we invest into where there's going to be more failure than success. I get that. that. That's the math, right? There will be more failure than success. And in each of those journeys, there's a team of people that had a dream that it didn't work out. And I think the like the venture conversation removes that emotional and psychological hit that the founders and the early employees take from a failed journey. And I try very hard in our business not to trivialize that because I think it's important to not, again, take my business and make it a founder's problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I agree. You're right. You're right, David. Thank you. Finally, um, we got no, there. No, we, we got there in the end. Um, I, I do think the one thing that's different is like, I'm speaking to a lot of GPs at multi-stage funds and they're going, I'm underwater with board commitments to my Series A's. My real Not stopping them from ripping those seed checks. No, no, exactly. But what they're doing, David, in Europe at least, from my perspective, is they're saying to their principals, I'm underwater, you go write the seed checks. And They've what's been happening- doing that for a long time. It seems this is that, not new behavior. It seems like it's being much more aggressive now. It's safer and easier to deploy a seed check if you have a huge fund than it is to write a Series A or B check at this moment. Exactly. And so, is it going to get worse with their intrusion into seed? It's not even worse. It's been this way. I think the idea that it hasn't been this way and this is a net new thing is just totally incorrect. Like since 2018, multi stage firms figured out that the competition for series A is so steep and there's only one winner that if you don't take risk on seed, you might not have a shot at the A. And so they're, they've been slanting earlier for a long time. And if you talk to each one of these firms, whether it's dedicated capital, whether it's dedicated people, whether it's a, a certain amount of time firm wide, um, they've been writing that $5 million seed round for long before the 21 period and, and long after this new downturn we're in. So you said there's two variables there in terms of seed round. Totally agree with you. How would you advise founders? Founders that listen, we have hundreds of thousands. What, which one's right for me? Amount of money, valuation, who? 
And if you go to a multi-stage firm and feel like they are the right fit for you in terms of who, I don't think it's, it's a general wrong thing to do. Like, there's not a generic answer to any of these questions. It's so founder specific. What are you working on? What are the capital needs? What's the background of the investors that you're working with? I do think it's important to surround yourself with a group of people, group, not individual people that can be a bit different in their perspectives. What we do at Box Group and what we hone ourselves in on is being aligned with founders. We, we say we want to be a friend of the founder, and we mean that in the longest term, most authentic way possible. So if you work with a multi-stage firm and they write the lead check, we're happy to be the second biggest check in the round. If you want to work with a seed lead, a traditional seed firm, we're also happy to be the second biggest check in that round. If you want to do a pre-seed or a small seed, and you want us to write a term sheet and write a you know, adorably nice check alongside a group of amazing angels, we're also happy to do that. And our job is to help you get to the next round and then help you get to the next round and the next round. And in doing so, there's some operational stuff that an investor can help with, but that is always overstated. What we are world-class at is helping companies raise money because we live there and we've been doing that for a long time. And it doesn't necessarily mean if you raise from a multi-stage firm, it's going to be harder or easier. And it doesn't necessarily mean if you raise from a seed firm, it's going to be harder or easier. How great are you building your company? That is the core variable of what's going to make your next round easier. Do you agree with the signaling risk that everyone places? Everyone's like, no. Why? Uh, because none of the next set of investors really care. Because every investor thinks that they have their own opinion and they're right and they're not really looking for someone else's opinion to like create their opinion. And the multi-stage firms don't care about the other multi-stage firm. We're I, too I, deep in the signaling risk, I feel like is the single most overstated uh part of the the ecosystem. I think, you know, series B and later, signaling risk matters. Maybe series A to B, it matters a little bit. Like if your series A lead is not doing their pro rata in your B, that is a material data point. But if your seed lead multi-stage firm is not doing it, there are ways to navigate that as a founder. And we are very happy to help you do that. I, I actually totally agree with you on that. What I always say actually is, the, I know, but this is a, we should have a little, I don't know if we have a fake clap. That right. We, we have like a clapping thing, yeah, yeah. some graphics. Exactly. The, the, yeah. the, one that I, the one that I do say, which I do believe, is the incentive misalignment, which is like me and you both want a great next round with a great price for the company. If a multi-stage firm come in and lead the seed and it works well, they don't want to have a super high price on the next round. They want to closet it and then take it into the trees themselves and get a good price. Correct. Do you agree with that? Correct. And look, there's also a reason sometimes multi-stage firms are not going to follow on. Let's say they buy 15% of a company in the seed round. Like, that's a lot. And so keeping pro rata at 15 might be good enough versus needing to get to 30, which is a lot of the company. Yeah. Or, you know... 15 to 22 isn't this necessary optimization. And so I don't think it's black and white. I think every single, what, I, what I've what i struggled with in my venture career is watching investors put out generic advice and founders read generic advice and assume that it applies to them. Every single company is very different and each specific variable in that company drives to how to build it. And I think our job as, as you know, early stage investors is to provide a customized service to founders. And so our at Box Group, we spend a ton of time trying to understand all the dynamics at play and give very nuanced, specific advice and tactical advice how to achieve that specific company's goals, the hardest part is when it's not going to work, right? And I'm not here to kill companies. I'm here to provide as best as I can honest advice and do so with 
you know, a goal of achieving success in whatever the next thing you have to do as a company is. You know, you mentioned about being the best at getting into the next round. I, I love that in terms of simplicity. We seem to be agreeing more and more. My question to you is, when you look at the companies that do graduate, I find there's this disparity between ones that I think will do very well in fundraising markets and then those that do where I'm like, wow, I wasn't expecting that to do well in fundraising. Do you, because ones- it's back to this generic thing, right? Like every investor in the market has a different view of, of the types of people and the types of companies they're looking to back. And that's the, like, venture gets viewed as an asset class and it's not. These are all very small businesses with independent investment styles and independent investment beliefs. And so, you know, in some way, the best thing a company can do is go to as many investors as they can get in front of because everybody's totally different. Just because you're a series A or series B or a seed firm, there's such a, a uniqueness to each approach that the idea that we can predict perfectly uh, a course is just a stretch. I do at the same time, think what what the meme and and the sort of content world has done a disservice to founders, and I think we're sort of past this, is telling founders like, put your head down, build a product, don't worry about fundraising. It's like distracting and annoying. The CEO specifically, their job is to become great at fundraising. And they need to be like, view that as a core competency that they should take responsibility for getting better at learning and being world-class at. And to your point, sometimes when you see companies raise a lot of money at crazy valuations, it's because the CEO became great at fundraising and pulled the company forward. Is that a net positive or negative? It's not black and white. It's a net negative if they can't execute and build a great company. It's a net positive if they can, because you've done your job. You got your company money at a valuation that was not punishing to the dilution of not just you as a founder, but to your employees as well. And that's a good thing. So how do, so I'm again, pretty much in agreement with you is starting to feel nicer again. Uh, I normally only agree. It's only because like we know each other that I feel that I can. So I would like you to disagree. No, I came no, here to spar, but no. no. But, no but I agree. With you, but what do you advise founders? Do you say like meet five? Because I also don't want, like, I don't want my founders to, man, we both have hot companies. They so get like 50 inbounds. I don't want them that distracted. I want like a home tight messaging. Don't give away too. But like, how, how do you advise them? How many, the right way to play it? We don't say my companies, it's their company. So I think first off is just like listening to them. What do you want? How much time do you want to spend on this? How much risk do you want to take in this process? So understanding their psyche is super important. And so a lot of the time, the beginning is like, what's your style? How do you, where are you going to excel? Are you distracted by 50 conversations? There are certain founders that are not, and that's a, that's a strength for them. It's a weakness for other people that then you shouldn't push them to do. And so I think it's really helpful for us to, again, view each journey, each company, and each step in the process as very specific. We, I believe very strongly that founders should consistently be building great relationships at every step of the way on their journey in every single category. So like long-term potential customers, long-term potential partners, long-term potential acquirers, and long-term potential investors. There is no reason why, I mean, Mark Mark Suster, uh, you know, wrote that blog post right, years ago, course. invest in Love lines it. and not dots, right? And it's that core view of, of how the world works of like, in 21, that frothy moment that we love to isolate, everything became transactional. And you could show up one day, meet six firms, and have six term sheets. And everybody spent about 18 minutes making that decision. The transactional shift happened because of speed and panic. Is that how life should work? Probably not. It's not how our business should work. And it's a disservice to founders because they don't get to know the people that they're transacting with 
other than by back channel reputation. And that's challenging. So in a world where you're not optimizing for purely speed, the more you get to know somebody, the higher probability, if you know both sides like each other, there's a deal to be had. And I view that the same way in venture. So I don't overly arc, uh, orient towards like, don't talk to investors until you're raising or like ignore all the inbound and play hard to get. Like if you want to get to know somebody, get to know them. And if it's not going to be like this massive distraction to you to have breakfast one day, which you're probably going to have anyway, have breakfast. <laughs> uh, okay. Do you think you, you've spoken a lot about kind of the generic nature of content? Uh, I am a producer of such generic nature of content. Yes. Um, you probably hate it. Um, Do I have to it, listen? To, no. Um, oh, no. No, I don't no, hate no, it. I no, think no, what no, I no, don't... It, no, no, yeah. but I'm saying, right, it, do you blame this generation of an investor? Because I genuinely just no, want to have... I'm, 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 I'm very... Are grateful, I am, but I don't want to hurt them. I think it's risky for founders to listen to things that are not specific to them and believe them and take them to heart and act upon them. That's totally decoupled from you building a business, a content machine, and creating content. I think the value of that content creation for the investor is enormous. You get brand recognition, you get deal flow, you get people valuing your distribution channels that want to let you get into companies that are hard to get into because you can help them grow audience. Those are incredible incredibly valuable things. Again, we decoupled the message from the value. And that I think is my, my point of like, don't my, I played uh, hockey in, in high school and my hockey coach was a uh, amazing man who taught me a lot of lessons. And there's a quote that, uh, you know, I, I live on, which is like, don't believe everything you read in the newspaper. Totally agree with that. And I view TikTok, I view podcasts, I view, you know, blogs and Twitter as in essence a newspaper. And I think it's important just not to believe everything you read in the newspaper. And I think it's hard when you are a operator and you see someone in a space or someone you know raise some crazy round at some frothy price and you're like, look at what they did. Let's get to the details. There's probably more, more back story to whatever you're reading. No, I totally agree. I think it's about having the self-awareness. Actually, that bit was really helpful. The rest, not so much. And that was probably a little bit too much in that capacity Here's what for me. I will take. I will yeah. apply to me and I will take and not just do it, but I will process it and do it in my way, in my style that's customized to me. Yeah. I, no, I, I like, you know, I, the other the other line that I talk to founders a lot about is like make, like, you know, you watch the Facebook movie, which is inspiring. And like people can say it's a good movie, bad movie. It's like amazing. Like, doesn't it, everybody wants to to And that's why have I became that... a VC. I was 13 yeah, and I saw uh, Peter Thiel invest in Facebook from it. It's it's the, to me, it's the most magical story of our industry. And like you can be overly critical, but like that's that's the goal, right? But make your own movie. You know what you're not gonna do? You're not gonna replicate that movie. You're not gonna replicate anyone else's movie. So figure out what movie is yours and make that and do that from minute one. So you are taking such a bet when you start a company on yourself. You're saying, I know something nobody else knows, or I'm going to do something better than everybody else. And then you start listening to outsiders and you start hedging that bet, that risk. You already took the risk. Don't hedge it. Just keep compoundingly betting on yourself. Take advice learn, iterate, but don't compromise the bet on yourself because that's the binary thing that you did that you should lean into. You know, David, one of my biggest mistakes that lost me, I think probably many years was I, I worked with investors who are much older than me and very brilliant investors, but I thought I had to be like them. I spent hours doing cap table construction and doing all the shit, uh, cohort, not, uh, not shit, but like, you know, skills of cohort analysis and all the deep work. It's just not me, David. Like it, it's well, not you, my... you spent the first half of this podcast telling me why my model sucks because everybody else's model is different, right? And so, in no, no, some no. way, no, your model sucks because you don't have a model. In some way, I am I am doing what I believe 
is my way of building this business. <laughs> and if everybody else does something else, awesome. I'm not judging them. I hope they're successful. I'm going to do it our way. And I need to be successful to our stakeholders and to myself and our team. I have three amazing partners. I have three other amazing investors on our team. We're a seven person investment team. I owe them immense responsibility, just like they owe me to all of us seven do great work together. And our job is to return as much capital as we can to our investors. So that's who we work for, but we work in service of the companies that we invest in. And the reason we do this job is because we get to work with people who have dreams and help them achieve those dreams. That's the package. We, we mentioned like my mistake that trying to be other people. Um, I, I also made mistakes with the last years with liquidity. I could have and should have sold in some big winners that were winners and probably now are not winners. How do you think about when to take cash off the table? Carefully. It's again, it's not a black and white generic answer. It's so nuanced. So we try hard and, and really align ourselves with founders long term. And so our goal isn't to look at the secondary markets constantly uh, in private companies. At the same time, my job is not to manage public stock. I have investors who are very capable of making their own decisions in the public markets that I don't feel the need to try to say I know better. So I think, you know, that's an easy lesson is, is let your LPs own the thing that they own when you can. Um, and in between there is like all this gray, ton of gray. I don't have a, I don't have a sound bite for you that you can go put on TikTok. Trust me, that will be many from this show, my friend. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I do want to ask you know, in terms of um, like other lessons, you know, last few years we've learned a lot. If there was like, and this is personal, so this is not anecdotal, generic, but this is just you, so you can say. Uh, is there any lessons that you have from seeing how you invested over the last few years and what you've taken from that period? As entrepreneurs and founders, I think the lessons is that starting a company's hard. It's hard in in every single market because the market isn't consistent. And so even if you start a company in a hot, frothy market where you're getting overfunded and high valuations, it doesn't mean that's going to be the status quo for the extent of the company and things change. And it's really hard. And you're going to go on those ups and downs. There's almost, if if any, uh, company that's ever just sort of went up. And I think going in eyes wide open to knowing what you're signing up for is important. And just because you can start a company doesn't mean you should. Um, you should start a company because that's something you're going to see through all the way. Um, so I think that's, to me, it became very easy to raise seed funding and to start a company and everybody got to do that. And I don't think people went in his eyes wide open to the challenges that they were signing up for. And I think it will end in a lot of uh, failure. Uh, on the investment side, um, it was very hard to not be transactional. And speed became a core tenant of the market and it was at every round. And so seed A, B were happening in hours to days versus weeks and months. And um, we, we participated in that because that's the game on the field, but the transactional nature of, uh, the industry, um, it's not the most fulfilling way to do this business. It doesn't lead to relationship building. And it's not that if we want to be best friends with every company that we invest in, it's that we want to get to know you so we can try to help you. And we want you to get to know us so you can know how to ask us for help. And when you're doing things so quickly, a lot of that authentic, actual deep relationship building that I think is fulfilling. It's fulfilling either, um, you know, emotionally or psychologically, but actually long-term it, it allows you to feel support. Um, that got removed from the industry for a bit. You mentioned the transactional nature. When did you raise the last set of funds? 2021. Okay. How fast will they be deployed? Two-year fund cycles? 
we are tried to be super responsible with our LPs capital. So three years. You know, I think we, uh, the hardest part of a seed model and a non-concentrated seed model is the reserves. We've come full circle. So how much of the fund makes sense to reserve and when the initial dollars are deployed up to that percentage is when we need a new fund. And so what I've seen happen over the past couple of quarters is there's been a slowing of what we view as like opportunities that we're excited enough to invest in at the seed stage. And so our deployment uh, capital per quarter has gone down. Um, I need to see it play out over the next couple of quarters to know when it makes sense to switch to the next set of funds. For the opportunity fund, how do you do the upside scenario planning there? Is it like, if we can project out a 5X, then we'll engage? Is it a 3X? Every, a every single investment out of our opportunity fund needs to be able to have a outlier outcome because it's a net new investment. It's not attached to the pro rata of the seed fund, right? And, what's, and so, what's an outlier investment though? Is that a fund return or is that a 5X? Is that a 10X? It matters what the risk profile is. It needs to have upside. So the whole fund can't be built off of underwriting a company to a 3X outcome because you're not going to be perfect and it that's out to 3X and that's not uh, the inherent goal. And so um, it needs to have real upside. In certain ones, you have unknown exponential upside and other ones that are probably later and more established in an you know, industry where you can get to a uh, more predictable outcome are going to have more confined upside. Did you make LPs invest in the two alongside each other? The word make is such a, a strong word, Harry. I don't make anybody do anything. Did investors invest in both alongside each other? Our investors are uh, aligned with the strategy that we uh, go after the, the business with. And I feel uh, very much like our job is to have a business and a structure uh, that aligns with LPs and uh, find LPs that feel aligned with the way we're building our business. You said align there. Um, you mentioned alignment a lot between VC and founder. Um, you also made me look like a shithead VC in this interview. You, seem you like do, you do it. I'm doing me. You do you. <laughs> um, okay. But you said about alignment. There are some areas where VCs and founders are not aligned. And I think it's important that founders know them. Like, where do you think the most prominent areas of those would be? My job's to work for founders. We get upset when founders are uh, dishonest or um, renegotiate agreements. Yeah. Those are the areas that I find to be upsetting and not what I signed up for. Uh, we are honest with who we are how we work, we put our word first and we try to live up to that. And I like to work with people who do the same. I agree. And that's it. Like I always say like liquidity is like, you know, there's nope. sometimes not my problem. Nope. On a on a portfolio basis, it's my problem. On an individual deal basis, it's their company and I'm here to support them. And we truly live by those words. Can I give them advice? Yes. Is advice meant to be listened to? No, it's not my job to tell a founder what to do. I can give strong advice, but it's their company. And again, like I respect that structure of the relationship. A final one before we do and a The mistake fight. is going to be much more costly to them than it is going to be to me. I totally get you there. I think not enough VCs talk about the portfolio approach versus the single company approach. Um, a final one before the quick fire, because David, I could talk to you all day. What does venture look like in five years in your mind, in the early stage? Do we see like the even further productization of multi-stage fund money at seed? Do we see the Tigers and Co. 2s come there as well and do it also? Do the boutiques survive? Help me. What I thought that? the crossover funds were coming to seed imminently if the market maintained the up moment that it was having. So I think if you didn't have the turn of the market in 22, you were going to see enormous amounts of capital pointed at seed, whether that was good, bad, or, or right or wrong, 
we didn't get to see that play out. I think the multi-stage firms have, as I said, uh, been doing seed for a while, will continue to do it. Um, there will probably be less investors because I think what this has done is push out the tourists. And I think the tourists were dangerous and the tourists were not here for the long term. And that was capital that doesn't make sense for founders who are here for the long term to be working with. Who and are the, who are the tourists? Wh whether the tourists were crossover funds that came in just because the numbers looked good and wanted to grab onto that. It's people that are, are you know, I go back to USV. USV is the opposite of a tourist. They are so focused and long-term in every single thing they do. They're consistent. They're loyal. They live by their commitments. And I have immense respect for the long-term nature of their business. And when I look at what we want to do at Box Group, we are who we are. We are who we say we are, and we're going to continue to be that. And that's the business we want to build. And that, to me, aligns with the timeline of starting and building a company. And so investors who are who are here, whether that's early stage funds that started and then you know funded things because they were going up and now are getting nervous and questioning things like, or it's crossover funds that showed up at the last minute. I think you pointed out Tiger and Co too. They're easy to criticize, but they've been investing in tech for a long time. They've changed their model. They changed their velocity. They've done things differently at points, but they they have been investing into private startups at you know a consistent basis for a long time. David, I, so, I think I think for their capital base and for their LPs, they will actually still perform to a averagely good level, given they have different expectations, which is great. That's what their investors expect. I, I'm not short on them. I think they'll be okay actually. Yeah. The tourists so to I, me are the one the tourists to me are the ones who came in because it was hot and they felt that venture was cool. Correct. And they've got Correct. no fucking idea how to do portfolio construction. They want to go to every drinks party with every VC in LA. They want to talk yeah, to every there's, other There's business. a bit more depth to that too of like they came in because it was hot and they're not going to stick with it. And I think when you have investors who you know, two years into your company's journey are no longer doing this business. I don't know. It's not the best group of people to have around the table. We are, uh, we are going to run, uh, whether you like it or not, the same model uh, for a long time. And I think what that does is it aligns us with founders who are also going to build their business for a long time. We are consistent. We're not going to suddenly be a Series A lead next year. We're not going to scale the size of an entry point and where we focus our business because our view is if we hold true to who we are, we're actually maintaining that relationship with the founder for the extent of the journey. David, I want to move into a quick file. I could talk to you all day. Uh, we, we had a mixture there. There was some agreement. We did some great. Agreement. It was we did awesome. Great. Uh, okay. Ready to rock and roll? Yeah. What would you most like to change about the world of venture? I would like that the ability for founders who are treated unethically by venture capitalists to be able to confidently discuss that publicly. So act, not casual bad behavior, but actual bad behavior gets policed out. I think it's really important that we find a way to expose predatory behavior. And that's not aggressive valuations. That's not structuring rounds. That is harmful her, uh, intent to hurt founders' behavior by VCs. I've never seen that, David. I'm I've not... seen that. You've never been around for these real downturns. And so when a company and a tier three shitty VC come together, bad things can happen. I saw a VC try to personally bankrupt a founder. That is unacceptable to me. And there are tactical ways that they do that. And when that happens, my view is I don't care if that company failed. I don't care how much money we as a fund lost. My job is to protect that human from bad actors. And uh, I wish that all of those examples got exposed. That's fascinating because one of my problems is like no VCs are actually willing to do the work because they're worried about poor MPS. I've had things where the company is actually doing terribly and we need to step in and help the founder. 
Like we are I'm helping talking, you. I'm talking po- way past the performance and into uh, truly bad we'll see, behavior. Do you think we'll see that come back in the next cycle? Yes. Hmm. What's the trend that you're seeing that others are ignoring, David? Uh, the, the trend to me that's most interesting is that people are bored with today's s- consumer products. None of them are fun. What's fun on your phone today? The fun has moved to content. Mm. And content is TikTok, content is YouTube, and content is, if you're you know into certain things, Discord or Reddit or Twitter or whatever those niches of the world, and you can call them communities, and sometimes they are, but sometimes they're just content. And in reality, content's always been fun. People have always watched TV. People have always watched movies. That time is actually still pretty consistent. It's just shifted into more diversified places where you are consuming content. And then you go back to the early days of mobile and the early days of the internet around connecting with people. And whether it's photo sharing or or different versions of that, the social part of the internet, it feels like has become very boring. And I long for... Uh, the days when that gets exciting again. We are open for consumer social businesses. We would love to fund them. We get excited about them. And I think you're at a point where the generation, the the 12 to you know 18 year olds, and then separately the 18 to 25 year olds have not experienced native products for them built by their generation that are fun. I did the pre-seed for Be Real. I would I would give them a... You, you did a great job there. Thank you very much. But I, I, what I thought was interesting, though, was you had Antoine Martin at Zenly, who's obviously now starting a new company. You have a Mike and um, Kevin at Instagram, and then you have Chad. And then there was another like OG of social who's doing it. So there's like this renaissance of the OG V1s who are coming back with V2s, which I think is interesting. Um, I want to uh, see the V1s, too. So if, if there are new people out there who are starting something that are V1, please... Well, the Reach trouble out. with the V2 is it's at 100. <laughs> uh, tell me, who, if they send you a deal, do you take it most seriously? Who are Sequoia. you like? Sequoia. They're good at this business. I would take Sequoia. No, I mean, we take mostly founders in our portfolio who send us things very seriously because they know who we are and they're choosing to send things to us. And we appreciate that. And that to us is as strong of a sort of feedback loop as it gets. What's the nicest thing anyone's ever done for you, David? Uh, my wife married me. That was nice. <laughs> What's the secret to a happy marriage, David? Um, mutual respect and, and trust. It's trust, right? Like implicit, deep loyalty and trust. And um, it's pretty simple. What, what's the hardest element of your role with Box today? Um waking up tomorrow and finding the next deal that's my job do you, I, re- do you really I, get FOMO when you miss a deal yeah and i obsess over tomorrow and i spend less time on yesterday does the FOMO help because sometimes it can probably help. not but i like our job is to make an investment tomorrow and that's going to be our job hopefully for the next 30 years what's the best investment advice you've ever received investors invest <laughs> uh, who's Brad Feld said that to me when I was just starting my career uh, and it stuck with me I, I appreciate that line my job as an investor is to invest it's pretty you, simple who do you think is the most underrated angel in the ecosystem I don't know if they're underrated I think the Collison brothers have you know built a investment portfolio that's probably uh, quite unique and um, doesn't get sort of discussed as uh, much as some of the louder operator angels out there. Um, it feels like they, uh, just like in building Stripe, do things at this unique quality that um, extends to all portions of their life. What do you believe that few around you believe? I, I don't think geography matters for startups. And I think, um, you know, we're we're based in New York because we live here and we want to live here. And just because we're based in New York doesn't mean that we invest only in New York. And Greg, our partner, lives in San Francisco because he wants to live in San Francisco. And I, I think geography gets overrated. 
Final one, my friend. What do the next five years hold for you? Where's Box Group in 2028? I truly hope Box Group is exactly where we are today. We don't want to be different than who we are today because we have immense belief that staying consistent is the best way to hone in on being world-class at your craft. And so this is our craft. Our craft is seed. We want to be world-class at uh, pre-seed and seed investing in people with dreams and ambitions who are going out to build, you know, 10, 15, 20 year and much longer term companies. And we would like to be there day one. And so five years from now, I hope the answer is the exact same. David, listen, it wasn't quite a duel or a fight to the death, but uh, it was a discussion for sure. We had uh, a great time, Harry. I, I can't thank you enough, my friend. Thank you so much. And you're a star. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.